my name is Katie Ledwig and I am your host for today's journey around Europe and Britain. Firstly, I would like to thank you for making Trafalgar your number one choice and we're so excited to deliver on those travel dreams. When you choose to travel with Trafalgar, you're choosing to tour differently, which means we're delivering exceptional experiences and we do it differently. Today is no exception. We're gonna take you to those destinations that you have been dreaming of. And it's real insight because we know what you have been searching for on trafalgar.com and we know what those top destinations are that you're looking to visit next. Now, before we get started, I am very excited and a little bit jealous about my co-host that is joining me today. His name is Jonathan. He's one of our fantastic travel directors. And guess what? He's residing right now in the south of France. So let's go over to Jonathan to meet him. Jonathan, are you there? Hello everybody and welcome to the French Riviera where, yes HQ, it has been an ordeal adapting to the 300 days of sunshine each year bestowed upon this part of France. And it's a good reminder today why this is one of my favourite places in all of France. It is also, it appears, in the midst of all of the places you want to visit most in Europe, but more on that shortly. As you know, today is about taking you on a sensory journey, getting to know some of the people who you'll meet when you come and travel with us. In short, we want to bring our world to you so that you can come and join us soon. Before we get started, remember though that along the way, uh, you can ask us anything you want and we'll take a few minutes at the end to answer all of your questions and there shall be prizes too. So grab a coffee, a glass of wine, your pets, your loved one, or all of them together, and get ready for a sensory journey of discovery. Over to you, HQ. Wow, Jonathan, your view is amazing. And having sun 365 days out of the year, I'm super jealous now, but very excited to have you with us today. So let's kick off our journey around Europe and Britain. We want to know what destinations you think people have been searching for for their European travels. Is it A, Italy? Is it B, Scotland? Is it C, Ireland? Or is it D, France? Go ahead and put your answers in that chat box. I'm going to check the chat box right now. See some answers coming in. We've got some very, very good answers here. Yep, I see some more answers coming in. I'm gonna give you a few more seconds to answer this question. To be honest with you, I feel like I'd like to visit all of these destinations. They're fantastic. All right, let's go ahead and reveal it. Of course, it is Italy. So let's go ahead and say buongiorno to our first destination that you have been telling us you want to visit. While I enjoy this glass of Chianti, let's go over to Jonathan and have him explain a little more. Well, of course, Italy is flying high on your list of places to visit in Normandy. Beautiful countryside, fine wine, Italian cooking, style, history, sunshine. I could, and quite often do, spend all day talking about Italy. It's also, tantalizingly close to me right now. In fact, it's about a 40 minute drive just to the left across here. So let's start with a subject close to my heart and um, quite often to my lips. One of Italy's greatest exports, in fact they are the number one producer in the whole world, but shh, we don't talk about that in France. It is of course the subject of Wine. Carol, dammi un bicchiere di vino rosso. Del Trebio, perfetto, grazie. Now, what you're seeing on screen may be the quintessential Italy that you've been dreaming of these past months. Cypress trees lining a Tuscan hillside right here at Castello del Trebio, which is one of our exclusive Be My Guest experiences. 
Hmm. More than just a winery, this jaw-droppingly beautiful place is also a treasure trove of history. It's the very spot where the Pazzi family plotted to overthrow the Medicis as rulers of Florence. Our hosts, Anna and Alberto, will share the castle's history with you, as well as their wine and a delicious Tuscan feast. Now, here's what's absolutely incredible. Everything that you will eat and drink during that wonderful meal is produced within one kilometer of the property. It just doesn't get any more local in terms of produce than that, does it? So grab your glass and let's learn about some wine tasting. Anna, si pronto? Tell us all about it. Hi, here we are at, at the Castello del Trebbio. Please come in. What we're going to taste, it's uh, one of our most important wine. It's a uh, 100% Sangiovese. Sangiovese is the king of the grape in the Chianti area. So we are going to serve our lastricato. You're looking the color of the wine because you don't know which wine you have in the glasses. So if the color are very deep and red, it means uh, maybe it's an important wine. And then you move your glass in this way because you wanna know it's a wine with a lot of alcohol or not. And when you move the wine, you have tire that comes out and as closer they are, and more alcohol is inside. The third step is smelling and the nose gives you all the emotion in your head. After all these uh, nice things, uh, we want to taste the wine. When it's mean tasting wine, it's mean uh, take some wine, keep it in your mouth uh, and try like close your eyes and find out the emotion that the wine gives you. And this is what we are looking. We can say that, that the goal of a good product is that when you sit at the table, you drink a glass of wine and the wine and the bottle of wine is empty. So I wanna say alla salute. Don't forget us. This is our most interesting Chianti Rufina. Our, the name of the wine is Lastricato. We have more than 50 year, 50 vintage in our cellar that waiting for you to share beautiful emotion. Alla salute and I'm waiting you. Ciao. Salute Anna and thank you for the four steps on how to drink wine. And Jonathan, thank you for the mozzarella and the basil for my caprese salad. Now, while I finish my salad and wine, let's head back over to Jonathan to learn more about Italy. This time, we want to see an experience that is all about culture. Jonathan, can you help? Thank you, HQ. Yes, Italy has such a depth of culture and it really is the cornerstone of Western civilization once you get to know the country more literally thousands of years in the making and we want it to remain intact for the next thousand years which is why we need to make travel matter and leave a positive impact on all the places we are so privileged to visit an illustration of this is our next guest the wonderful marta cuccia she is one of the last remaining renaissance weavers in her studio in perugia italy She's here to tell you her story and how she's missing you, our Trafalgar guests. Trafalgar helped save her business, in fact, several years ago, so she could continue to produce these beautiful and intricate fabrics. Buongiorno, Marta. Hi, everyone. I'm Marta. I'm the great-granddaughter of Giuditta Brozzetti. She founded this atelier in 1921, and now, after four generations, we are one of the last and weaving studio in Italy. You can imagine how glad I am to work here every day. Please follow me, I'm gonna show you where I design my creations. This machine is original from 1750, but the technique is medieval, and I'm still use it. 
This is a pedal loom and I control the warp with my feet. For every different position of the pedals, I have a different point of design. Then I'm designing, I'm making the design with my feet. I hope you enjoyed this little tour and I look forward to seeing you all again. Ciao! Isn't she amazing? You will love Marta. Chic, fascinating, creative, and she can work all of that magic with just her feet. I personally loved meeting Marta, and there's nothing like being able to dive into culture and meet the locals within the destination. I don't know about you, but I'm ready to board a plane to our next destination in Europe. But before we do head northwest, let's get a quick snapshot of those trips that we have in Italy. Whatever Italian experience you're after, we have it at Trafalgar. So make sure you jot down your questions and we'll be happy to answer them at the end of the presentation. Okay, it's now time to board that plane and we're going over to our next destination that you have been craving about and it's my all-time favourite place to visit, Ireland. So let's start with a quick fire question. Which traditional musical instrument was adopted as the logo by Guinness? So the question is, what traditional musical instrument was adopted as a logo by Guinness? Go ahead and put your answers in that chat box and I'll be back with the answer here soon. Okay, so I'm gonna check the chat box. And I see some answers coming in. You guys are doing fantastic. We've got some great answers here. And of course it is the harp. Let's head over to Jonathan to find out a little bit more about what we have to offer and how we tour differently in Ireland. Slauncher. More than ever right now, you are telling us you want open green spaces and friendly locals. Well, if there's one place you are sure to get both of those, it is in Ireland. Today, we have legendary Emmy-nominated chef, Catherine Fulvio, who is going to share with us her family recipe for soda bread. She's one of our Be My Guest hosts and her food is utterly scrumptious. And Catherine is quite the character herself, as you will soon see. Now, how many of my favorite ingredients are in this recipe? Bread, Guinness. You may want to grab a pen for this one. Irish farmhouse soda bread. I learned this from my grandmother and I wouldn't like to tell you how many years ago that might have been. So, why do we make Irish soda bread? Well, that's because our flour is this beautiful cream flour and it is a softer flour. It's lower in gluten. So it doesn't work efficiently with yeast. So we've always used bicarbonate of soda. Some people call it baking soda. And here in Ireland, we call it bread soda. And we use that to make our breads. And to go with the bread soda, we have to use something sour, buttermilk, sour milk, or natural yogurt. And the soda reacts with the acid here, bubbles form and bread rises. And that's how you get a lovely soda bread. So to start with, I wanna do a brown soda bread, which is really the more traditional. And I want to do it with a little twist. So I'm gonna make you a Guinness brown soda bread. We pop our flour into our bowl, our mixing bowl here. Both flours go in together. This is our soda here, in that goes. And we put in a bit of salt. And then I have this lovely muscovado sugar. That's optional, but I like the little bit of sugar in it. I think it gives a nice color. And then I have my clean hands and I put my hands in and I just aerate by mixing my ingredients together like this. And would you believe we're nearly finished? We now make a well, little hole in the center. And then we have here our Guinness and we have our buttermilk. So I'm just gonna mix the buttermilk. You can just use the handle of the spoon here and pour that in. And then we put in some Guinness. The Guinnesses give a lovely kind of deep shade, but also a lovely malty flavor out of it. Let's give that a little mix and see how we get on. And already I can see the soda reacting with the buttermilk. So this here is our mixture. It doesn't have to look glamorous. It just has to look like that. And then this goes into a loaf tin. So this is how my mother used to make the soda bread. So it's a lined loaf tin, very simple. And we get our ingredients from here to there and into the oven. 
The other thing you must do when you make soda bread is you draw a line down the centre, like this. So when it bakes in the oven, it opens out evenly so there's no weird cracks. And then I have some oatmeal, I'm just going to pop the oatmeal on the top and that'll give me a lovely topping. I'll see you back here in 45 minutes. And here it is straight out of the oven. This is our soda bread from Ballynockin Farm. It's important they always take the soda bread out, to be honest, when it's nice and warm like that and let it cool so that it gets a little bit crispy around the outside. And this here is our Ballynockin soda bread to enjoy with a cup of Barry's tea and some of our homemade raspberry jam. Hope you get to make it and hope you enjoy it. Oh, hey, you're back already. You know, I got so excited about the soda bread, I decided to make some of my own. Just put it in the oven. You know, while that's baking, let's learn a little bit more about Ireland and Scotland. We know that they're the nation of storytellers, but we also learned that Guinness has a heart for a logo and that you can use it while baking soda bread. Let's go over to Jonathan to learn more about Guinness. Did you get the answer right with the harp? Well, no trip to Dublin is complete without a visit to St. James's Gate and the Guinness Storehouse, the home of Guinness itself, to taste Ireland's national drink. It is fantastic here. You will love it. And as well as a view over the city at the top of the storehouse, you'll be rewarded with a fresh pint of Guinness. Just for you, our friend Alan Maxwell, one of the beer specialists, is here to teach you the secret to pouring the perfect pint. If you have one in your hand, you'll appreciate it even more. Now, not everyone knows how to do this, so you may wish to take some notes. That's if your mouth is not watering too much. Over to you, Alan. So hello ladies and gentlemen, you are very welcome here to the home of Guinness at St James's Gate. My name is Alan Maxwell and I'm one of the beer specialists here in the Guinness Storehouse. Today I'm going to teach you how to pour the perfect pint of Guinness. The first thing we do whenever we want to pour the perfect pint, well we take a Guinness branded glass. We use this because the gold harp on the front is going to be our reference point and a Guinness glass is flat bottomed on the inside which allows our nitrogen gas to escape. The next thing we need to do is we rest our glass against the top nozzle, we rest that against the inside of the gold harp and we hold our glass at a 45 degree angle. Pull the top handle all the way down. As the beer goes into the glass, we're slowly going to straighten it. And when the liquid reaches the top of that same gold harp, well that's when we're going to stop. And that is the first part of our two part pour for a Guinness draft. Why? Well, what we have going on now is what we call the Guinness Surge. If you look at our pint, you can see that it's got a very skinny head at the moment. There appears to be something falling down the sides and it's just a little bit dark on the bottom. What's happening now is that nitrogen gas that we use, that's shooting up out of the pint. 30 million bubbles in there, all trying to get out. And as they do so, that's what forms the beautiful head on top. You can see already, as some of the gas has escaped and settled and cleared at the bottom, the head of the beer is really starting to thicken up where we want it to be. What we're going to do next then is we're going to top it off. Now, the reason we stop at this point is it's at the widest part of the glass and it allows the head on the beer to develop. In Ireland, we want it about two centimetres. That's the preference we like. Now we can see that the pint is fully settled, the gas has escaped and the head has developed. Like I said, we're ready to top it off. But this time, we're not going to pull the handle towards us. We actually push it away towards you, the customer. When we do this, it limits the amount of pressure and flow that goes into the pint, so you don't have to wait for it to settle all over again. You've been patient enough. So we take our pint, we hold it underneath the tap, and like I said, we're pushing towards the customer this time. We want the pint to fill up so that a small part of the head sticks out of the top in a smooth, creamy dome. We serve it with the logo facing forward and that should be the perfect pint of Guinness. From when I start to pour until I serve it to you, it should take 119.5 seconds. Enjoy. Salivating here a lot. Now what was it Alan said? 45 degree angle, right? 
Well, delicious though this looks, it's gonna to have to wait until later because another one of the places that you are longing to visit is Bonnie, Scotland. And of course you are, it's one of the loveliest countries in the whole world. Home to Loch Ness, James Bond, the finest whiskies in the world. And I can vouch for that. Oh yes, and me. So it's time to hand over to two of my fellow countrymen and to more of our Be My Guest hosts, Fergus and his son, Gregor Wood. When you visit them at their home at Loch Ard, Loch is the Scottish for lake, you will actually go into the building where Rob Roy grew up and you'll be treated to some true Scottish hospitality. Fergus is one of, in one of the top Cayley bands in all of Scotland. And Cayley uh, literally translates as dance, but it refers to a social gathering. So you're in for a real treat. This farm is located in the Trossachs National Park near the world famous Loch Lomond. And if I say Loch Lomond again, I think I will feel a song coming on in this outfit. So let's hand over to Fergus. Welcome to Scotland and to our farm, Kinlochard. It's a beautiful glen with a lovely loch. We're going to give you a little tour in just a second um, of the, the buildings which are ancient. We'll, we go back to 1487, it's the oldest building on the farm. So it's a, an ancient place with bags of history, mostly around the Rob Roy period and the Jacobite Wars. This is McGregor's barn where dinner or lunch is served. Uh, it was built in 1604 as a mill barn and Rob Roy came of age in it in October 1689. As you can see there's a lot of weaponry on the walls, uh, weaponry of the Jacobites and Rob fought at the Battle of Killiecrankie, the first battle in the Jacobite Wars in July 1689. Right, once you've enjoyed your lunch or dinner with us in McGregor's barn, you'll be over here into the bar, the Stables Bar, also built in 1604. This is a place where people enjoy a nice whiskey, as you can see. Many have been enjoyed over the years, and you'll be enjoying one as well. It's a great place to get together. And music, can I just say, is a major, major, major part of what we do here. We're all musicians in our family. So we thought we would give you a wee sample, a lovely slow air, entitled Hector, the hero after Hector MacDonald, the great Highland general, featuring Gregor on the small pipes and me and the harmonica. Really looking forward to seeing you guys, uh, everybody, when you come to our farm. Ladard Farm is known for great hospitality and there's going to be a lot of great stories and you're in fantastic company. Fantastic company indeed. Time for some whiskey tasting, anyone? Slangevar, gentlemen, as we say in Scotland. Now back to you, HQ. Who else feels like they're in Ireland and Britain right now? I am just about to have a cuppa with the soda bread that I made earlier. Turned out pretty well, right? And Catherine was correct. It was really easy to make. But before I dive in, let's get a summary of our Britain, Scotland and Ireland trips right here. We can truly bring your travel dreams to life whatever you want to go. Don't forget to jot down your questions and we'll answer them at the end of this presentation. It's now time to head over to our last destination and it is somewhat a little bit warmer than the United Kingdom. So time for another quick fire question and don't forget to answer in the chat box. In what year was the Eiffel Tower completed? So your question is, what year was the Eiffel Tower completed? Was it A, 1763? Was it B, 1834? Was it C, 1889? Or was it D, 1904? I'm gonna go ahead, check that chat box now and see what answers are coming in. All right, checking the box now. I do see some good answers coming in. This one stumped you a little um, compared to some of the, the other two questions that we've had. 
I do. I'm going to give you a few more seconds and I'm going to reveal that answer for you. Okay, let's go ahead and reveal the answer. If you said C, 1889, you are absolutely correct. Great job. It's now time to go over to Jonathan for him to tell us a little bit more about what we have to offer in France. Another place hot on your list of destinations to visit is, of course, France. I mean, bien sûr, you have impeccable taste, and who would not want to come here to the home of haute couture, the finest fromage cheeses in all the world, and of course, who could forget the Eiffel Tower? And did I mention fantastic red wine? Mm, mais oui. And, of course, this. We also want to take you, though, on some experiences that are off the beaten track. And this is all the difference about touring differently. One of those experiences is meeting the delightful Poppy Salinger. Now, to our American friends, that name may ring some bells because her late husband, Pierre Salinger, was none other than press secretary to JFK. So, yes, this lady has a tale or two to tell, but rather than hearing from me all about Poppy, let's go and meet Poppy herself with her son and chef Emmanuel at her home in Provence, La Bastide Rose, which is located just about two hours across there by the setting sun. Over to you, Poppy. So this is La Bastide Rose. It's our wonderful place in Provence, in France, of course. And uh, we would love to share it with everybody, but we'd love to share it with you. And we are going to show you a little bit of the garden, the river, everything that we enjoy here, which is nature. We have had this house for 20 years. And for 20 years now, we've put it together. And every day, every year, we make it a little better. Now, let's go to the museum. We have a small museum for Pierre Salinger. He was my husband, but he was mainly press secretary to John Kennedy. And I'm happy to share with you a little bit of history. This is Pierre Salinger Museum. This is his picture for his 50th anniversary of being a journalist. And uh, we would like to show you all these different aspects of his life. And of course, a lot of pictures. Uh, the most important picture is, of course, the day uh, John Kennedy knows he's been elected for the presidency, and this is in Harry's Sport with Pierre. I've been cooking for 16 years here in Provence, and I'm so happy to share all my best recipe with all the ingredients that I've been growing here or getting in the market with all the farmers products, all the, the zucchini, the, the eggplant, uh, with uh, some, uh, some great uh, fish or meat and uh, we'll be having such a great time eating together and sharing wine. In France, we love to share a welcome drink called aperitif. And in Provence, the best one is rosé. So let's come and cheers. Wow, Poppy. Culture, history, and food all in one experience. We certainly do tour differently at Trafalgar. And thank you for being with us today to share what you have to offer in France. You know, France has gotten me so excited. Let's go ahead and see a summary of what we have to offer there. And remember, jot those questions down. It will soon be time for our question and answer session. As you can tell from our journey today when traveling with Trafalgar, not only are you going to get experiences that are not available in any guidebooks, but we are going to make it easy for you which means you can sit back, relax, and enjoy your hard-earned vacation. Well, that's it from me. As I go to enjoy some cheese, bread, prosciutto, and wine, I wanna say thank you for joining us today. We are very, very excited to welcome you onto your next Trafalgar trip.
And we're going to head over right now to answer any questions that you have about any of our Europe, Opera and Trips. So that's it from me. Cheers.